Romans 8, I just want to start with verse 28. If y'all find Romans 8, 28. All right, before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to praise you and to worship you. Lord, we know that we fail in so many things, and we ask that you accept our feeble uh, worship of you and that you correct what's wrong with it. But Lord, we want to glorify, we want to worship, and we want, we want to honor the Lord Jesus Christ with all that we do and say. Lord, we ask that you build us up tonight from your word. We ask comfort for those that need comfort, and those that are grieving and mourning, or those that are sick. Anything that's needed, Lord, of your people, we just ask that you, you take them and lift them up in your mind. We put them before your throne. Saints all around the world that are suffering, Lord, we know they need your prayers. We put them up before you. Paul told us to pray for all saints, and we want to do that. Lord, above all things, we want to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to make known what he's done for us and the precious grace that's available to anyone and everyone if they'll just believe on him. Lord, thank you so much for the precious gift. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> uh, before we get started, I just kind of uh, keep y'all up to date a little bit. But um, if y'all would, Chris is back in the hospital. So y'all keep Chris in your prayers. He's having problems with his legs again. And, but uh, remember Chris, and then also remember Don Hampton. Keep her in your prayers as well as her little girl. Um, if you don't remember, she lost her husband, and that she's going to need prayers from, from here on out. And then um, I'd also ask you to remember Sister Yanni, or you know, I don't even know if you say it, Janny or Yanni. I always pr pronounce it Yanni, but she's from the Netherlands, and um, she lost her husband here. Both of them real, real strong believers. She lost them about oh, a few months ago, and it's. When you've been together with somebody all that time, especially when you're believers and they've been your, you know, spiritual partner and teacher, that's so y'all remember her. And anyone else, if I forget, I'm sorry, but generally when people ask me to pray for them, I try and do it right then because I'll, I'll just, I'll forget, you know, it names with me. <clears throat> okay, last uh, Wednesday we talked about the humbling of Peter. Remember we showed how God used the example and God used the experience of Peter denying Christ? And then used it for later for Peter's own benefit. Well, last week was the humbling of Peter. And tonight I'd like to look at the training of Paul. Now, Romans 8.28 says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Now, all things. It doesn't say we know that all things from the day you're saved. All things is all things, isn't it? So what I want to look at tonight is I want to take another example. We're just going to do it with Paul the same way we did Peter. And I want to show you how in the Scriptures we can see how God was engineering things in Paul's life from, from the mother's womb. He was engineering Paul and getting him prepared for what he had for him to do. And now we're going to just look at some stuff tonight and then go back and consider why. First off, let's lay some groundwork about Paul. To begin, go to Acts 22. Acts 22. Now Paul's before the uh, council here and he's got to uh, defend himself. But I just want to look at a few things that he says. To start off with here, he says, Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense which I now make unto you. When they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence and he saith. So several things we're going to note about Paul. Okay. One, he spoke Hebrew, didn't he? Now, I only say that because not many of the Jews could, but if you go back up to 21, verse uh, 37, it says, Paul was led into the castle, as he was. He said to the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? So then Paul could also speak Greek, couldn't he? Back in 22.1, verse 2, When they heard that he spake in a Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. And he saith, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous towards God as ye are all this day. So then Paul is a Jew. He was born in Tarsus, 
And look, Tarsus was known for its education system, and yet his father ships him off to Jerusalem, doesn't he? And he's trained by Gamaliel. Yeah, it's, a, it's an elite Hebrew teacher. I'm glad you asked. Go back to uh, Acts 5. We'll find out who this man was. In Acts 5, they're, they're getting a council together how they're going to kill him. And they're planning, hey, we're going to kill Peter and John and we're going to stop this thing. And now they're putting all this, they're all hot and around the collar, and they're ready to get a plan together. But in uh, Acts 5, 34, Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law. In other words, he's a lawyer, a teacher. A lawyer, not like we have lawyers, a teacher of the law. It says, had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. He didn't just ask, he commanded. This man stands up and all of a sudden starts speaking, doesn't he? Remember when I was little, they had those commercials when E.F. Hutton speaks, you remember that? And everybody would stop and listen. Well, look, all these council members, priests, bigwigs, and all, when Gamaliel speaks, they do what he says. Now watch. He said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Thutis, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about four hundred, joined themselves, who was slain, and all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. After this there rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing, and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily you, or happily you be found even to fight against God. And he, he, they basically follow his uh, suggestion, don't they? So then this man, Gamaliel, is respected. I mean, you read the Jewish writings of the time and you'll find out, I mean, that's like saying I went to Harvard when you trained under this man, right? So, so far, this is what we know about Paul. Alright? Go back to Acts 22. Y'all just bear with me. We'll lay some groundwork. And we're going to consider some of the reasons why. Paul had that kind of clout when he was under the law before he seemed to lie on the law. It seems like he did. Yeah, it seems like it. He, you know, when you've been trained under somebody that's... Like, I'll give you an example of... Alright? In the NFL, they're all hiring coaches. After the, as soon as the season's over, they're all hiring coaches. Who, where do they always start at? They start with the Patriots assistants, don't they? They look at all those assistants. In other words, they were trained under Belichick, weren't they? So they're respected because of who they were trained by. But you know what? Belichick came under Parcells. Parcells was like that, wasn't he? And that's how coaching goes. These guys all have a, they call it a coaching family tree, and they all come. But Gamaliel trained Paul, and so certainly Paul is respected in his day because of his education. Now, just to show you what some of what he believed, look in 22, verse, uh, uh, let's see, I can't even find it now. Well, I'm sorry, I can't even see the verse. Go to chapter 23. In chapter 23, Paul is standing up before the council, and it's Pharisees and Sadducees, and he says, But when Paul perceived the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. So then Paul is a Pharisee, and he didn't just join this, did he? I'm going to put Pharisee by birth. And I don't mean he was born a Pharisee, but his father was a Pharisee, therefore he trained him to be a Pharisee, didn't he? Yeah. Now remember what a Pharisee is. The word Pharisee means to separate. The Pharisees thought they were the cream of the crop, didn't they? They not only looked down on the Sadducees and the Essenes and all the other Jews, they certainly wasn't going to be around a Gentile, were they? Who was the most elite segregated group? The Pharisees. Yeah. Now, when Paul said he spoke Hebrew, there's a lot to this. The Hebrew language, look, they had gotten scattered, and essentially the Jews were scattered in two directions. And one group, you know, went under Babylonian captivity, and through their mixing with Babylon, Hebrew became Aramaic, and that's what was spoken more than likely in the land when Jesus was tied. But 
If you went to the other side, you got Grecianized, I'm going to say, and you, you Greek became your cousin. Your center was Alexander. So you had the two groups. And when you get in the book of Acts, you'll see amongst the Jews, those two groups had problems. Remember the Hebrews versus the Greeks? Well, Paul here speaks Greek, but he also speaks the Hebrew. In other words, Paul can speak both, yeah. both ways. So Paul is eminently qualified to deal with the Grecian Jew or with the Aramaic Jew, isn't he? He's qualified to do both. Now, he's born in Tarsus, but he's sent to Jerusalem. So he comes from the Grecian Jews, and yet he's trained up under the, under the Jerusalem Jews, isn't he? Alright, go over to chapter 26. In chapter 26, verse uh, 6. No, I'm sorry. Verse uh, 4. Paul said, uh, My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among my own nation, and, and at Jerusalem know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion I lived the Pharisee. So what he's saying is, was Paul well known in Jerusalem? And did they know he lived after the straightest sect? So all of them knew, this is not, this man's not in the bar rooms and all. This man is uh, very serious about his Judaism, isn't he? They go over to, uh, well come down to verse 22. Paul says, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. So, did Paul know Moses and the prophets? Absolutely. So, Paul is trained. He's an expert on the law. And I'm going to put the prophets too. Okay? We find out in another text, well, I'll tell you just to show you, go back again to... Uh, let me find it here. 23, I think it is. No, 22, 25. Acts 22, verse 25. Now they're, they're locking Paul up here in Jerusalem. The centurions got him. And it says, As they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that's a Roman, uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed we do, this man's a Roman. Now the chief captain comes and says to him, in verse 28, The chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. In other words, this man had bought his freedom, hadn't he? And Paul said, I was born free. So we know then also that Paul is a Roman citizen, isn't he? Born there. And he's born a Roman citizen. I'll put born free. Now, there's, there's a couple things we can kind of read in between the lines. For instance, go back to Acts chapter uh, 6. Yeah. Alright, in Acts chapter 6, they've named, that you had the, the problem in the church at Jerusalem, there between the Grecians and the Hebrews. And they named the seven deacons. And they're all Grecians. One of them Stephen, a Grecian name. But it says here in verse 8, Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and them of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. Now, the, the implication is a Libertine is a freed slave, Right? Now, when they all these people from the other parts would come back to Jerusalem, they would have a synagogue they would gather in for the feast days and whatnot. And at this particular synagogue, it was a synagogue for the libertines of those areas. Now, notice what one of those areas is. Uh, libertines, Cyrenians, Alexandrians. Again, that's, that's the hub, the central part of the education of a, of a Grecian. But it says, and of Cilicia... Now, Cilicia is where Paul is from, Tarsus. And we know that Paul's at this synagogue, but there's no doubt about it because they, they right here at this synagogue, they get men, they say, hey, we're going to stir them up, get everything going, and they're going to kill Stephen, aren't they? And who's there? 
there's a young man named Paul. And look, young man, they could refer to anything under 40, so it doesn't mean he was a little kid. Right? So anyway, basically what you have here is here's a, a, a synagogue for the liberated Jews that had been liberated from where they were slaves and now they're... So at least Paul wasn't liberated. It's possible his father was. But if his father was liberated, he'd be born free. Or his grandfather. But either way, Paul's a Roman citizen, isn't he? Does that mean he can travel anywhere he wants to? Unmolested, he can travel, can't he? Okay? So we've got all this going on. But now go over... Flip back over to, uh, well, we all know the story, but tell you what, let's just read down from Acts 7, uh, 54. Stephen's preaching. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. They cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran upon him with one accord, cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. So that we know Saul's at that place and Saul's here. Now if you come on down chapter 8 verse 1, Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Now it's my opinion that that's the fulfillment of the final clause in Daniel 9. He, he said he would, uh, there would be so much time until he did some things and he accomplished the scattering of the people. There they are, they're scattered. Now it says verse 3, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. Okay, so Saul now is a persecutor. I'm going to come on this side and we'll put some of the things he does. Well, we'll just continue down here. He's a persecutor, isn't he? He persecutes the church of God. Okay, go over to uh, Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1.11 Alright, in Galatians 1.11 Paul says, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel is preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now rather than consider that this was something brand new, what he's really doing here is he's proving that he's not the least bit behind any other apostle than me. He said, look, yeah, they spent three and a half years with the Lord, but you need to understand something. My message came from the Lord. I, I also spent time with the Lord. Now verse 13. You have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion. Was Paul rising to the top? Mm -hmm. Folks, he's the ringleader. I mean, this is the man that's really you know leading the charge. I persecuted in, uh, the Jews' religion above many of my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Was Paul a zealous man? Yeah. So were the Pharisees. Sure were, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Now look, along with zealous, I'm going to put active. Because he wasn't just zealous in, in talk. He was, a, he was said it and did it. He was a go-doer, wasn't he? Now he says here in verse uh, 15, But, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb. When did God choose Paul? All right, he said he was chosen from the womb. And there are people that play around with that and try and make it mean Israel's womb. No. Matter of fact, Paul said he chose me from my mother's womb. We know that in fact, when did he choose him? Before the foundation of the world. Okay, I just wanted to lay down some of these facts. And there's more. We'll, we'll add a few more. But here's the question. If God had chosen this man from his mother's womb, in fact, from before the foundation of the world, could God not have stopped him from persecuting Christians? Yeah. Sure he could have, couldn't he? Yeah. Did he? Well, why not? Wouldn't that be, you know, people look at this and, Hey, we have friends that would say, well, God doesn't operate that way after the cross. He's not involved. No, baloney. 
That's absolute. It's not true. There's no scripture that says that. Yeah. Go over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy 1 verse 12, Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me. Did God pick Paul because he was so able? No, no he enabled him. For that he counted me faithful, accounted him faithful, putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. Now let's put this up here. I've got persecutor, but let's put up here blasphemer I can't spell it however it is blasphemer but anyway he says now a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious but I obtain mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant now what does exceeding abundant mean abundant means a lot doesn't it he said it was exceeding abundant. In other words, could he put a number on it? He couldn't explain it, could he? Did Paul understand full well what being a recipient of the grace of God meant? And he says, exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am chief. Was he just uh, exaggerating? No. He believed himself to be the chief of sinners, didn't he? He just said so. He said so. Now verse 16. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. Now I want you to consider that for a minute. He didn't say in me first he's going to show forth a new message. Paul said that in him for a pattern to see what was shown to him. He was the recipient of all long-suffering. Now what did he mean by all long-suffering? Folks, if there had ever been someone that God should have killed, was it not Saul? Yeah. And did God show him all long-suffering? Now I want you all to just think, why did God do that? In order for him to do what he had to do once he got seen the truth. You got it. God's training him. God is allowing his the experiences, everything he's God didn't make him kill anybody. God is preparing him. I misspelled that so bad now I'm looking at it and I'm like, ugh. All right. God is preparing Paul, isn't he? And did his being a blasphemer and a murderer of the church actually uh, enable him better on this side of the cross. The yeah. heal probably and oh, seeing yeah. Christ is just unthinkable. You know it had to be. It is unthinkable. But I want you all to consider something. What did those experiences, number one, I'm going to come over here and we'll write them in blue. What would those experience being a recipient of all long suffering? Once Paul saved and out here in his ministry, what would knowing that he had been the recipient of all long suffering make him? How about humble? Obedient. Obedient. Faithful. How about gracious? gracious Had he been a recipient of all grace? Mm -hmm. Now he's going to go out and show it, isn't he? Yeah. But I want you all to consider how the Lord did this, right? Now go back over to Acts 26, and we're going to read one more verse, and we're going to kind of apply some of it. In Acts 26, verse 6. Well, let's say verse 5. He says, They knew from the beginning, if they would testify, that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and judge for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. And that hope is resurrection of the dead, eternal life. Unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Now, he's just said, 
Why are y'all so surprised that God can raise the dead? Right? But what does Paul in the back of his mind know is more important before you can ever get talking about physical resurrection? What does he know? You've got to be spiritually raised from the dead, don't you? So watch him give an example. He says in verse 9, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints that I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Folks, he didn't just round them up. He voted against them. They put them to death. They locked them up, men, women, and children. I punished them off in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. So has he just gone back in time and told them over here what he used to be like? You ever seen a man more dead in sin? More opposed to God? He's saying, you think God can't raise the dead? Do you remember what I was? Now watch him say here. 12, whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. When we're all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice saying unto me, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now, can you find anything in the story anywhere that says that Paul was repentant and, and sorry and seeking after God? Folks, if you'd have met Saul five minutes before this happens, and you would have asked him, are you in good standing with God? What would he have told you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Man, I, you better believe it. Not only am I one of Abraham's seed, I'm a Pharisee. I'm the most zealous, right? Yeah. So then there's nothing in the story where you can say Paul got down and started seeking the Lord. He didn't. But had God chosen him from his mother's womb? He said, when the time came for God to reveal His Son in me, how did it start? Boom, here it is. He's knocked him to the ground, hadn't he? Alright, now here he is on the ground. Verse 14. They fall to the ground and he hears, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now that does not mean that his conscience is pricking him. People say that, but there's nothing in the story that says that. The prick here is an ox goad. An ox goad is the way you take a big old ox a big powerful ox, they would take a, a thorn, a, a straight thing and a stick, and they would poke them. You know, we don't do this today, but when Scott had all those cows over in Louisiana, he had a cattle prod, electric cattle prod. The joker hit me with it one time. Hey, you know, he had a big old bull. You couldn't control that bull. That bull would smash you. Would just hit. The power in one of them big old bulls was unbelievable. But you know little old Scott, sick with a feeding tube, could do whatever he wanted with that bull? He could take that, that ox goad, that prick that's in there, and he could get that bull into every position he wanted him. Literally, I, I helped him one time, and he would round them down into a thing and get them down, and they'd keep coming down more and more narrow, and he'd keep getting them through here, and he'd lead them into this place where he had this mechanism, and only one cow could go through it at a time, and when they got right in the middle of it, Scott would stop them and pull this lever down, and it would lock on their neck. And he had them then. And that bull couldn't do nothing. And he'd worm them and spray them for flies and check them. He would do all in that chute, he called it, right? See, in order to do what he wanted to do to that animal, he had to get him in just that position, didn't he? Where did the Lord Jesus Christ have Paul at this moment? Right where he wants him. Where did he want him? Laying down in the dirt. He's knocked him off his high horse and he's laying down in the dirt. And essentially what he says is, okay, now, big man, it's hard for you to kick against the prick. And had this been a big man in the Jews' religion? Yes. Folks, this is Paul now laying down here in the dirt. Now he says, I said, who art thou, Lord? Now does Paul know who the Lord is? He knows the Lord of the Old Testament. Yeah. He knew all about the I Am, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Did he know about a coming Messiah? Yeah. yeah. He just didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. Like the rest of them. Just like the rest of them. But watch what he's fixing that get. Verse 15, he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. In the blink of an eye, what does old Saul know over here? Christ is the Messiah. 
Everything I have been doing has been wrong. How sure was he that he was right? Folks, this man was certain. If you would have asked him all the reasons why Christ couldn't be the Messiah, he'd have gone to the law and started showing them to you. Well, he can't be born in Bethlehem for number one. How's he going to come from that? Or he's supposed to be. How's he going to come from that? How this and how that? And on and on and on, right? And yet when you get over here, he's laying down there and his first thought's got to be, how could I be wrong? Everybody up with me to that point? Okay. Now watch what he says to him. Rise, verse 16, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Did he say, you've gotten saved and now I'm gonna, I've got a job for you? He said, I appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now I want you to just stop for a second and consider this. Where is God about to send this Pharisee to? Gentiles. What did a Pharisee think about other Jews who weren't Pharisees? They're sinners. They call them sinners, don't they? What did he think about a Gentile? Oh man, come on. That's worse than that, right? Now consider what he's going to do with this man. Why did he allow this man to persecute the church? He allowed it because it's going to work out for this man's own benefit and the spreading of God's plan. I think that helped motivate him to what he had been doing. What he had what been, sure. Seeing the Lord. Yeah. But I want y'all to just think now. Here we've got him. We'll just go ahead and put him on this side. He's saved. Here he is, Paul. All right. Before we consider some specific things, let's just look at it. Number one, God made sure that in this man's training, he spoke Hebrew. When a person gets saved, does God change their personality? No. He saves the personality and the personality remains. How about the traits? They remain. How about the different talents and attributes? How about the weaknesses? They remain. Didn't those things work to his advantage? It worked to his advantage. That worked to his advantage. Sure. Travel like you said. God had him all trained and he didn't even know it, did he? Yeah. Now, the reason I say this sort of thing is this. Whenever Paul is, is about to go out and, and begin his ministry, naturally he's going to have to change everything he thought. But don't you still see the same personality? Yeah. For instance, was he the most zealous Pharisee in the bunch? Well, who became the most zealous apostle? Was he the hardest worker amongst all of them? Yeah. Who became the most hard? See what I mean? He had the attributes, didn't he? But first, he speaks Hebrew. Now, is that going to benefit him over here as the apostle to the Gentiles? Yeah. Because yeah. every time he goes in, where's he going first? The synagogues. Folks, this man can, can talk with whoever he comes in contact with. Is he also speaking Greek? Everywhere he goes. Any problem? Any, it could be any language barrier. No. no. He's born in Tarsus. Was he familiar with the area he was about to go to? Folks, all them churches in Galatia, this is where the man's from. Even Asia, all that, he, he understood that, didn't he? Okay. How about being trained by Gamaliel? Was this man an expert on the Old Testament? Yep. Now I want you all to think, is that going to turn to his benefit over here? What's the only thing he's got to prove his point over here? Prove his message? The Old Testament. Go back to Acts 17. Acts 17, 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they come to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered, risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. Now, was this man steeped in the Scriptures? What Before he gets saved, was his understanding all perverted? Remember Christ told the Jews, search the Scriptures in them, you think you have eternal life? They are they which testify of me. 
But more than any other man, this man knew those scriptures, didn't he? Hebrew Bible and Septuagint. Most of when Paul quotes, he always quotes from the Septuagint. But either way, Paul goes out now and he's going to begin preaching. Is God going to begin to reveal some things to this man in a manner more than all the other apostles? He is. Not something brand new that had never been written. He's going to begin to show him the truth of what those Old Testament Scriptures said. That salvation is also for the Gentiles, isn't it? Yeah. Who better to begin to understand the mystery that was in that Old Testament than a man that knew it so well? God didn't have to train him to learn it. This man knew it, didn't he? He had known it backward and forward, hadn't he? And yet now he's going to begin to learn what it's really about. Yeah. It's like Paul, God is going to begin to give Paul a commentary on what he had nearly memorized. And he's going to start seeing it, isn't he? Now, as he goes out amongst this group of people, what's he going to be encountering? The persecution, the persecution for sure. But folks, he's going to be encountering the worst kind of paganism you can imagine. You know, when, when a people turn from God and they get into paganism, it always winds up in just rampant, just open, uh, open sexuality, homosexuality, uh, killing kids. You know, every, every civilization, they do this. And this is exactly what Paul's going into. Can you imagine a Pharisee out amongst them people? Eating with them and all? Yeah, and the Old Testament's full of that, what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. So but hold on just a second. How could this man, how could he put up with these Gentiles? How could he show them love? How could he be long suffering with them? Yeah. He had been a recipient of all long suffering. Do you see how God had made this man see? Yeah. Was there ever, was there going to be any chance that Paul was going to go out there and see some Gentile somewhere doing something and say, well, now there's one that can't be saved? No way. Well, why not? Because he could be saved. Folks, God showed this man the depravity of himself, didn't he? And it's going to work to his benefit among the Gentiles. But there's something else. As Paul begins to preach to these Gentiles, who is he going to begin having trouble with? His own kind. The Jews, right? Can y'all think of anyone more qualified to answer the Jews' objections? There ain't nobody. There's not going to be anybody more qualified than this man. Now what I mean is this, okay? Paul preaches to Gentiles, and by just some examples that would come up. A Jew that knew the Old Testament Scriptures would say, hold everything, Paul, you have lost your mind. Turn to Jeremiah 31. Okay, and they would turn to Jeremiah 31. And people would do this to you today. He would say, now Paul, watch this. In Jeremiah 31, verse 31, the prophet Jeremiah wrote, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, Paul, the new covenant is going to be with Israel and with Judah, not with Gentiles. There it is in the Scripture. You're wrong. Right? And yet, Paul would say, Well, hold on just a second. Now, I'm going to go... Y'all turn with me to Romans 9. He didn't have Romans, but this is what the doctrine that he knew. Watch Romans 9. Watch he can answer that objection. You know, if you were not as steeped in the Old Testament as Paul was, somebody would take you there and get you get out of kilter. You'd say, well, wait a minute. That does say that, doesn't it? But God had begun showing this man, hadn't He? Paul would say, well, now hold on a second. That's true. The new covenant is for Israel. It is for the Jews. He said in verse 6, But it's not as though the word of God have taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, to the man in the synagogue, Sir, you misunderstand. They which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. He would say to the man, Hold on, sir, the Jew. That's right, it says that it's with Israel, but the problem is you misunderstand who God calls Israel. I once thought it was only the Israelites that were Israel, but God showed me that no, God has an Israel that's got nothing to do with the Jews, doesn't He? And He said, it's not Israel after the flesh. And the man would say, well, that's insane. You have got to be Abraham's descendant. If you're Abraham's descendant, 
then you're God's people. And Paul says, no. He said, verse 9, this is the word of promise, at this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah had also conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of him that calleth, uh, uh, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. See, Paul can say, wait a minute, don't you remember the story of Abraham? Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. And God wouldn't accept Ishmael. He accepted Isaac. So it's not just about being Abraham's seed, is it? And the Jew would probably say, well, wait a minute. It started with Isaac. From that point forward, and Paul would say, no, what about Esau? See, God had made this man, I mean, this, he's trained for this. This is the perfect man to send out amongst this group of people, isn't it? You know, another one would pop up and say something like this. Go to Genesis 17. In Genesis 17, Abraham has given the, the token of circumcision, isn't he? And in verse 14, he's told this. 17, 14, Genesis. The uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Right? Okay, we'll do one more. Go to Isaiah 52. Now, here we've got Paul. He, he's explaining, preaching to Gentiles, and a Jewish man comes up and can't believe that this man is doing this. And the Jewish man says to Paul, Sir, have you lost your mind? Don't you know what the Scriptures say? And Saul would say, Yeah, I'm aware of what the Scriptures say. And the man would go to Isaiah 52 and say this. Awake, awake, verse 1. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. And he said, Now, how are you going to tell me that Gentiles can be saved when they're unclean? Now, what did God show Peter? Don't call anything unclean that I've cleaned, right? So, but what about Paul here? He's out there in the synagogue and there's Isaiah laying in front of him. And it says, no unclean or uncircumcised person can come into the assembly of God. In Zion, there's a picture of the church. Now, Paul would say, well, that's true, sir, but go to Romans 2. Romans 2.25, Paul would say, well, sir, in verse 25, circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcised. He'd say, sir, circumcision is very good if you keep all the rest of the law, but have you broke any of those laws? He says, 26, therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? In other words, what's better? To be circumcised in the flesh and break all the laws or to keep all the laws and be uncircumcised? You see, he, he's, he's putting up an argument here. Now, in 27, he says, Shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, it's how we're all born, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? See, he's proven you're a lawbreaker and you're hanging everything on circumcision. But then he says in 28, for he is not a Jew, or I could say Judah, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision, circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not of the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Now this Jewish man says to Paul, you can't preach to these Gentiles. Maybe he's even a Jewish believer, like the church in Jerusalem. What did they tell the Gentiles? You've got to get circumcised. No uncircumcised man can come in. Abraham was told that. Hey, God does not deal with the uncircumcised. Then Paul says, well, you're looking at the wrong circumcision. The circumcision that we had in our was actually the circumcision of the heart. And the man would say, hold on. It never said that in those exact words. And Paul would say, sir, consider the whole of the Scriptures. Right? 
And he said, well, tell me how in the world then can someone that's uncircumcised be saved? And Paul said, well, go over if you would. The Romans. Chapter uh, 4. In chapter 4, Paul says, What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, is pertaining to the flesh of things? He said, okay, let's consider Abraham. Right? The Jews knew all about Abraham. He says, uh, verse 3, What saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And the man would say, yes. And he'd say, now when did that happen? He'd say, right there in Genesis 15. That's when it happened. Abraham, when God made the promises, that's right. And that night he took a covenant. Abraham was justified. And Paul could say, well, sir, was Abraham then part of God's people? Well, of course he was. That's our father Abraham. And Paul's next question would be, well, was Abraham circumcised at the time? No. And you know a Jew never even thinks along those lines. You know, I can remember when I very first saw that Abraham was a Gentile. I was like, wait a minute. No, no, no. Abraham's a Jew. You, we get colorblind to the, to the ideas and tunnel vision, don't we? We can't see outside the box. All we can see is what our preconceived idea says. Now he says here in verse uh, uh, 9, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. And the man says, that's right, it was. In Genesis 15, that's what it says. Paul says, how was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but uncircumcision. He says, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised. That, or in order that, God did it in this order, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Folks, God could have circumcised Abraham in Genesis 15, but He didn't. No. Now Paul's telling them over here why He didn't. He said God separated His salvation from His circumcision by at least 14 years. And the reason He did it is so over here you can see it ain't circumcision. He said it's got nothing to do with it. Now he says, verse 12, or let's read 11 again. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had been yet uncircumcised. See, both groups are in there. He says, look, God saved Abraham back there while he was uncircumcised to show that an uncircumcised Gentile is saved by faith. He said, but he also can be saved and he will save the circumcision, not which is circumcision in the flesh only, but the circumcision which has the same faith Abraham had. So what you've really got in verse 11, you've got the Gentile believer, and in verse 12, you've got the Jewish believer. We could read it this way, verse 12 and the father of the circumcised believing Jew, to them who are not of the circumcision of the flesh only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith. See, in other words, it's not just physical. Mm -hmm. Which Jews would God save? Physically circumcised? No. no. Physically circumcised can only be saved if they've also got circumcision of the heart, right? Yes, yes. And the man would say, well, hold on, this just, this just don't make sense. Now, wait a minute. God made promises to Abraham, and He told Abraham, In thy seed all nations shall be blessed. Now look, I don't care how you slice it, Gentiles are not the seed of Abraham. And Paul would say, Sir, you misunderstand in your Old Testament Scriptures. Go to Galatians 3. In Galatians 3, verse 6, even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. In other words, Paul could say to the believing Jew, Sir, this Gentile has believed just like you. He's the seed of Abraham. And the Gentile, the Jew would probably say, No way. And he would say, verse 9, or verse 8, 
The scripture foreseen that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And he says, As many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. The Jews that were still trying to keep the law for, for righteousness, they're under a curse, aren't they? He says, verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, be made a curse for us, for it is written, Curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Why did he do this? That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulled or added thereto. And now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one unto thy seed, which is Christ. Can y'all think of a better person to go preach to Gentiles? No. No. Folks, this man was, what God prepared him, look at every sort of way he's prepared. Even the fact that he had been a Pharisee. Folks, you couldn't have found a more racist man than Paul. There, you couldn't have found one. He hated all nations and he hated those of his own nation that weren't from his denomination. Right? And yet, what's God going to do with him? Send him to all nations. And you see, I mean, this man was, was prepared, wasn't he? And if you go down and look at all the things that he was, everywhere Paul went, he travels freely. He's a Roman, isn't he? Remember in Philippi, a Roman citizen? And he uses that to his advantage, doesn't he? So then all along, God has, has made sure that this man, all the experiences, his entire life's path, if I just said, here's Paul's life, he's born here as a Jew, if you just followed the path God led him down, and followed the trail he led him to, to that day he got saved. As Paul saved later, and he looks back on his life from his earliest memory, you know what he began to see? God directing his steps. Same thing as Abraham. Same thing as Abraham. Same thing as me and you. Same thing with us. Yeah. You, he, as he looked back, huh? even when he rebelled against God and was at an all-time low, what would God do? Use it to train him. Did God use Paul's own murdering to make him the most open-minded, uh, accepting, loving, yeah. great? Yeah, folks, he is. When you put it like that, see it. But I, you know, some people might have trouble with that. Be a little. Take a word without seeing this being talked to them can't see that. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't believe he did that for him. You know, what God did to him. Well, you know, to, to, to flip it around and let's think about it, okay? Paul persecuted and killed folks, didn't he? Yeah. You, someone would say, well, it might have worked out for Paul's benefit, but you're going to tell me God let them people die? Now that's cruel, is it? Where are they at today? They with the Lord. What did they receive for that martyr's death? Rewards beyond. You think any of them are mad at Paul? Folks, do you think anyone, do you think Paul is mad at the Romans for cutting his head off? Folks, anything that we do in the name of the Lord glorify. So then, not only was Paul shown the depravity of his own heart, not only was Paul made to see how he was nothing but uh, deserved nothing from God, he deserved death and hell, but those folks died a martyr's death, magnified the name of Christ, and went on to be with the Lord, didn't they? We're the same way about that, isn't it? We are. Looking back at what God has helped us and brought us along that we got saved and we slip back and you can see him, you know, helping us. You can. you can look and see how God's been. Yes. Now, come on over here and let's do one more thing. Was this the man that, that Jesus Christ said, He's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles? Yeah. Was that going to mean he was going to receive a lot of opposition from Old Testament Scripture people? Yeah. They're going to say, no, Gentiles can't have it, right? Yeah. Who's the one more than anybody else that God revealed the mystery of how the Gentiles and Jews are going to be in one body? Paul. Well, who's the one? Do you think, who do you think knew the Old Testament Scriptures better? Paul or Peter? Paul. Who do you think knew him better? Paul or John? Paul? Who, I mean, I don't care who you select. None of them had the background that Paul had, did they? You know, Peter Peter struggled with the idea, didn't he? And what did it take? It took Paul to straighten him out that time, didn't it? I mean, think why. Folks, Peter was a fisherman. And, and I'm not saying he didn't know the Scriptures. 
I'm saying that this man understood exactly how the mystery applied to those Old Testament scriptures. Now go to Ephesians 3. Well, Peter should have known about what he, God showed him about the sheep and the animals and going to Cornelius, huh? He should, but you know, we are all prone to forget yeah. and yeah. lapse right back to what we've known, aren't we? Yes. Yeah, exactly. All right, now, in Ephesians 3.1, Paul says, <clears throat> For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensing, the dispensation, the stewardship, the, the giving out, the handing out of the grace of God which is given me to you, word. Now, consider that. Is that saying that God gave Paul something completely different and special? Or did he say, I have received grace and now it's being dispensed through me to you? Yeah. Look who he says. Yeah. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you. How did the grace of God pass to those Gentiles? It passed through the man that had been the recipient of all long suffering. God's grace passed through that man to them, didn't it? What was enabling this man to go out there amongst them pagans? Folks, he had been... He, you know, if you would have took someone... I'm trying to think of an example to use, but... All right? If you had someone that had, uh, had never in their life said a curse word, had never drank, had just been raised in the strictest religious family, and let's say they, they, they get saved and they're a true believer, Right? But you got some uh, family that needs to hear the gospel, and man, they're a bunch of drunken, wild men, and they just and, and you know one of them is in trouble and needs to hear the gospel. Who would be better to go to that person? That person or someone that did, had seen some of that in themselves? See, that person would naturally ha have an affinity towards, or, or have a lack of affinity towards, and they'd be, you know what I mean? It would be more natural for Peter to turn from the Gentiles in Antioch than Paul. Why? Well, Peter had denied the Lord. Peter never killed anybody, had he? He had never slaughtered any of the church, had he? Had Paul been made, had Paul received something that he deserved less than anybody in the world in his mind? Yes. yes. So what did that make him able to do? Preach to anybody in the world. Okay. Now he says again in chapter 3, verse 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four and few words, chapter 1 and 2, whereby when ye read, chapter 1 and 2, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. He said, you want to know what, what's going on here when you read chapter 1 and 2? God's revealed this to me. Now let's read it without the parentheses. Verse 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, chapter, verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Which apostles? All of them. Which pro All of them. He, Paul's not alone in this, but who's the one that's getting the full... That, that this is his ministry. Isn't it? Now he says, verse 6, here's the mystery that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ by the Gospel. You know, he, I was taught, and, and I taught, I'm sad now to, to think about it, but it's, anyway, basically would, would read the verse this way is what I was taught. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs with Jews of this brand new system, of this new thing no one ever heard of. He doesn't say that. In fact, he says, Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of His promise in the Messiah, that's what Christ means, by the Gospel. All. Oh. So basically what Paul's saying over here is, look, do you see that I have been made the man more than any other that God revealed the mystery to? That all along God's plan was not Gentile flesh and Jew flesh there being a difference. All along God's plan was that a believing Gentile and a believing Jew are all in the same body. And matter of fact, Paul says, it's always been that way. Because if you go back here, Abraham was a Gentile. What was Abel? A Gentile. No such thing as a Jew. 
How about Noah? Gentile. So basically what he's saying is the mystery is this. That in the Old Testament, God used Israel as a picture or an example of the church. In other words, one nation separated from the other nations. Paul said, but the true nation is the new nation, the, the church, the body of Christ. And what the Jew was to the world was just a figure of what the church is to the world today. And so Paul went out and he's eminently qualified to take the Old Testament Scriptures and show this and read his writings more than anybody else in the New Testament who says, as it is written, as the Scriptures say, according to the prophets. In other words, Paul was always proving his case based on what? His knowledge of the Old Testament. And who made sure he was trained in that? Folks, his parents got him out of there and sent him at a young age to... You know, in the, when someone has a lot of money today and they got a child and they're training them up to be, you know, somebody, they send them off to boarding school, don't they? Get them away from the neighborhood and get them off to boarding school. And then it's off to uh, Harvard and then Yale, at, right? Or not Harvard and Yale, but y'all know what I'm talking about. Well, Paul is sent off to Jerusalem. He's trained. He not only knows the Greek Scriptures, Old Testament, but he also knows the Hebrew. He can speak both. He can interact either way. And he's trained under the most expert man under the law. Now, do you reckon anybody ever said to Paul when he was uh, expounding the Old Testament Scriptures, where did he learn this? Didn't that also cause them to back down and listen more? I would imagine. Because they, they knew he knew what he was talking about. Yeah. You know, let's let's do it this way. If if somebody came up to me and they all right, I used to be in the bodybuilding, so I thought I knew something about a human body. A man come up to me and says something like, uh, "You know, uh, man, I got this hurting, you know, or whatever." And I said, "Well, you think that?" And when he turns around, I see his University of South Alabama Medical Center, and I see that. You think I'm going to start talking all to him about the shoulder muscles? What am I going to do? <laughs> I'm going to kind of just let him say his piece and assume he knows a whole lot more than me. I mean, what do I know other than how to tear one up? Or You know what I mean? But in other words, when you see a person's credentials, it sometimes, like Wayne says, it kind of back you down in a position of listening, wouldn't it? Yeah. This man learned from Gamaliel. Yeah. Hey, they knew that. These Jews knew this man perfectly well. Yeah. So I just wanted to go over this tonight just so we could kind of look and see the way that God has all the events in the life of one He's chosen. They're all working out for His own benefit, aren't they? We can look back on them and see them, but today we need to use those things. Yeah. Let God use us in the spreading of His message, and whatever those attributes and experiences you've got, God will use them to His benefit. Okay. Alright, any questions? Okay. Thank you all.